gentleman over here. I'm going to introduce you in a minute. Okay. How are you doing? How are you doing? Good to see you. So I too have a few disclaimers to make before we get. So going. do I. But, <laughs> but I thought I might start off by uh, just reminding us all why we're here. Uh, there was a report that came out earlier this week. And I'm looking at a story about it in the New York Times. It, it talks about this UN scientific panel on climate change, painting a, painting a far more dire picture of the immediate consequences of climate change than previously thought. And the report said that avoiding the damage requires transforming the world's economy at a speed and scale that has, quote, no documented historic precedent. Now for the disclaimer. Uh, these are the ground rules. Each candidate will be given two minutes for an opening statement and two minutes for a closing statement. Each candidate will be asked the same questions and will have two minutes to answer each question. The moderator, that's me, can ask a question, uh, can ask a follow-up question. That means I'm the wild card factor here. The candidate will be given one minute to answer that follow-up question. The timekeeper in the front row will raise a green card at the start of the time period. I think it's actually electronically done this time. A yellow, it'll turn yellow when 30 seconds remain and red when time is up. Candidates must stop speaking when the red card is shown. Uh, due to IRS rules on candidate forms, we will not be able to take questions from the audience. Uh, questions for tonight were chosen by the sponsoring groups, me and from submissions through Facebook and Twitter. All questions were shared ahead of time with both candidates. We ask that the audience please not interrupt the candidates and hold applause until the end of the forum. Anyone who interrupts the program will be asked to leave the theater. Wow, okay. <laughs> so um, we're going to start off. Governor, you have a, a two minute uh, opening statement. Well, thank you, Bruce. And I do have a legal set of statements I'd like to make before I start that nothing I say should be attributed to me or to my campaign. Uh, <laughs> let me start by saying that, um, first of all, I appreciate all of you being here and I appreciate the work and the advocacy and the information that you bring to these incredibly important conversations and discussions and policy making. Um, with respect to the issues we're gonna discuss, and I'm sure we'll get into some of them later on, I think the most important thing I would say is that the issues associated with climate are not purely limited to climate. And what I mean by that is they cover a much wider collection of uh, policy areas and decisions. And the one I'm gonna to speak to briefly in my opening remarks here is housing. Um, we have a housing problem. In Massachusetts and for 50 years we built 30,000 new units of housing every single year and then starting in around the 90s we started building about 8 to 10,000 new units of housing and for 25 years we've basically built less than half the housing we used to build every single year and that's created a crisis and the crisis looks like this we don't have much inventory the inventory we have when it comes on the market gets priced way above what anybody would have expected it to cost. Um, that drives people of virtually almost every income level farther and farther away from some of those markets and the places that they work, which then means they have to travel much farther than they anticipated they would have to travel to actually get to where they were working. And people talk about the housing thing as an affordability issue, people talk about it as an economic issue, people talk about it in a lot of different ways. But when I think about the consequences of the current state of play when it comes to housing, I think about those things. I absolutely do. But I also think about it as an enormous environmental issue. And one of the reasons we work so hard with so many people to try to get a housing bill through the legislature during this past session was because this one feels to me like it touches a whole bunch of areas, including this one. and. Um, and the work that we do on all these other issues is equally important, but I would just start by saying that one of the things that makes climate and one of the things that makes decisions about energy and environment and transportation and all the rest 
so important is they cover a much wider swath of issues than people realize at first glance. And the one that really, to me, sort of crystallizes how broadly these issues cross is the housing issue. And um, whatever happens with respect to November and beyond, um, if I'm fortunate enough to continue to serve as governor, you're going to hear me talk a lot about housing in the context of environmental policy, which may sound a little odd. And one of the things I would say to all of you is that I think you should include that in part of your conversations when you deal with the legislature and with others. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so I started off with a really short question. And by the way, since you gave me like a whole bunch of other questions about a whole bunch of other things, all of which I was planning to answer when I got asked, it didn't make a lot of sense to me to incorporate them into my opening statement, <laughs> which is why I tried to go in a different, slightly different direction. Makes sense. So I had a very uh, short question. I was going to ask whether the T had enough money to do its job. And I'm going to ask that. It was short and sweet. But you had already, you and your opponent had sort of talked about that at your debate earlier yep. this week. So I thought I'd try and go in a little bit different direction. Oh, so now you're going to ask me a different question than the one you asked me to prepare for. <laughs> yeah, it's the same question. Um, <laughs> but at the debate, it went something like this. Mr. Gonzalez argued the T needs a lot more money to bring its infrastructure into a state of good repair more quickly, faster than the 15 years that the T is currently projecting. You fo focus more on laying a sound framework for improvement by getting the transit, transit agency's fiscal house in order and upping capital spending to a whopping $8.1 billion over the next five years, nearly double what was spent in the previous five years. Let's go a little deeper on your answer. The $8.1 billion doesn't include money for at least one high priority project, South Coast Rail. That still needs to be found. There's also no guarantee you will reach that $8.1 billion target. The head of the T's Fiscal and Management Control Board has indicated he is deeply concerned about the agency's ability to meet that goal. It seems to me that reaching that goal and going even farther is in many ways a question of money and manpower, having enough money to do the work and having enough employees to oversee the awarding and oversight of those contracts. It seems like the T during your administration has done a, done a lot of the tough spade work for the T's future success. Why not go faster and farther, even if it requires more money? You have two minutes. So first of all, um, the discussion about the T has focused for many years on resources and not on policies, procedures, follow through, execution, talent, strategy, and a whole bunch of other issues. And most of those conversations around resources have involved expansion. There's been very little discussion about the core system except for the constant refrain about the state of good repair. Um, I, I turned around a very broken health plan when uh, I was in the private sector. And I remember saying to somebody one time that I'd never come across an organization that was as broken as Harvard Pilgrim was when I got there. And um, the T was way more broken than Harvard Pilgrim. <laughs> Not even close. And Stephanie Pollack, I think, put it really well, Secretary Pollack, when she said, if you just give the T more money right now, all it's gonna do is be like a bathtub with a big hole in the bottom. It's just gonna run right into the top and right out to the bottom because it doesn't have the musculature or the capacity to actually do the work that people would like to see it do. And this is boring and it's not interesting, but it is fundamental to actually creating an MBTA that works. And a huge part of the work and the effort that we've put into that place over the past three years with one exception, which we'll talk about on one of your other questions, was to get it to the point where it could actually do the work it was intended to do. It didn't spend $1.5 billion in available capital in the five years prior to us taking office. $1.5 billion that never even went out the door that was available to it financially and budgetarily. That could have been spent on a lot of really good stuff. And the first time it ever spent a billion dollars on its capital program was last year. And in that same year, it spent 867 million, the highest number it's ever spent 
on reducing its repair backlog and hitting on its state of good repair. Now they, that $8 billion isn't a made up number. People spent almost a year figuring out how to incorporate the work that needs to be done to create the reliable, dependable transportation system that people around here deserve in building that budget. And everybody talks about, and I get it, the orange and the red line cars, and I'm very excited they're coming, and I think what the Patrick administration did by establishing that relationship in Springfield with CERC was brilliant, and I've said that a hundred times. But there was a billion dollars of infrastructure spending that needed to be done on the red line and the orange line to ensure that people just wouldn't be sitting in delayed and slowed trains that were much nicer than the ones they used to sit on. And that's why we just issued a $250 million signal contract and there are literally $700 million of additional contracts associated with other elements, associated with the core platform of the orange, the red, the blue, and the green line, coming right behind them. So your time is, is, is up. I could talk all day about this one. <laughs> but in fact, but in is, fact there, I, is there still a hole in the bathtub? It sounds to me like the, that's what I meant. The spade work has been, has been, a lot of it has been done, of what you're talking about. Is there still a hole in that bathtub? The Secretary Pollock and the folks at the T need more people to actually hit this five-year goal. They're going to get it. I mean, I've said many times that I feel like Ahab and the whale when it comes to the T. Um, Where are you going with that? <laughs> As an environmental justice issue, I know you have a question here about this. As an environmental justice issue, this one's for real. If you think about the bus system, which we've paid more attention to in the past four years than anybody paid attention to in the previous 10, most of the people who ride the buses are among those who need most of all to have a public transportation system that works. They also need one that spends time talking to local communities to figure out how to do things like create designated bus lanes, which we finally started to do after years of push and negotiation and a couple of pilots that worked, and actually changing some of the issues with respect to how the traffic lights work in the morning. Where well, we've done demonstrations that we've been able to prove to local communities that if you actually let the buses run, it doesn't screw up the traffic that's coming on the cross streets. And this is slow and it's incremental and it's painful and I get that. But if you really want to create a system that works for everybody, the buses have a lot to do with this, which is why we replaced a third of the fleet, which when we took office on average was 18 years old, and why we just put in an order for a whole bunch more. And when it comes to the rapid transit system, that third rail that we replaced after the winter of 2015, it was a disgrace. And we bought all the third rail that was available in the United States of America for the next two years and replaced it all on the red line and the blue line. We've been replacing tracks, many of which haven't been replaced in decades. And anybody will tell you it has to be part of actually what you do if you really want to create a rapid transit system that works. And on the commuter rail, I said this the other day in the debate and I got an incredible amount of grief for it, we've replaced 200,000 railroad ties that needed to be replaced. Boring? Yeah. Not interesting? Yeah. But if you want to take the speed restrictions in the summer and the winter off the lines that have been there forever, you got to do it. If we need to hire people, if we need more resources to hit that $8 billion and deliver on that five-year plan, we will find them. We need to move on to the next question, if that's okay. So on transportation- Do you think I'm not gonna talk about the T before the end of this meeting again? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next question is on transportation and climate from the Environmental League of Massachusetts. Good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon. Uh, Nancy Goodman with the Environmental League of Massachusetts. Uh, another transportation question. Uh, transportation is the largest source of CO2 emissions in Massachusetts and across the region. Without meaningful transportation emission reductions, we'll have a really hard time meeting overall emission goals. 
As you know, Massachusetts has been participating in the regional effort called the Transportation and Climate Initiative, but we have yet to see anything concrete emerge from that process. As governor, what will you do to move this process more quickly and get us on a path to 2050? So, first of all, um, we have been participating in those conversations and, um, and they're difficult and they're complicated and they're much more difficult and complicated than the ones around creating Reggie when it came to energy. Um, we have a futures commission that's being chaired by Steve Kadish that's going to issue a report on uh, transportation in December. And, um, and the reason for that is uh, I was interested in a lot of questions, but there were three in particular that I really thought we needed to get an answer to to deal with this particular question you're asking. One is, what really is the realistic time frame around electric vehicles? And what are the things that we can do as a commonwealth to nudge that process along? That's question number one. Question, is it five years, is it 10 years, is it 15 years? Or is it more? And depending upon where you sit and which study you read, you can get a lot of different answers. And that has a big impact upon how we think about what we're supposed to be up to for the next five years. Second thing is autonomous vehicles. What really is the time frame around autonomous vehicles? Uh, how far behind the electrification of the fleet generally are they going to start to land? And the third is this question about where are people going to live and where are they going to work? And we've done a whole bunch of scenario planning around that, and I know they have as well. And that has real implications for how we think about how we use the transportation system generally on a go-forward basis. Um, I happen to think one of the things we can do and should do is build fun, I guess is a better way to put it, a lot of the charging infrastructure that's required to make it happen. Because one of the things that um, we've concluded about this is until you have a 300 mile radius on a charge, it's going to be very hard to get a lot of people who would otherwise choose to go there to buy an electric vehicle. And that, or lease. And that means you have to figure out some way to create enough charging capacity that people will actually feel comfortable if they can only get 150 or 160, 180 miles into the game. The other thing I would say um, is we have some decisions to make in addition to the regional piece around transportation and Reggie. We have some decisions to make with respect to how we want to think about building codes and where we might be able to create more charging capacity in addition to sort of what I would think of as the freestanding stuff so that we get more people interested in the opportunity associated with these vehicles, even if they're only doing 150 or 200 miles on a charge. Next question is about environmental justice from Clean Water Action. Uh, hi, Governor. I'm Vic Mohenka from Clean Water Action. So across the state and the country, people of color, working class and poor people and people whose first language is not English are disproportionately impacted by environmental pollution and climate change. The 2014 Executive Order, number 552, directs all state agencies to develop meaningful environmental justice strategies. Please name two specific examples of current environmental injustice in communities in Massachusetts and what your administration will do to relieve the burden on those communities. Let me start with, um a T issue, sorry. Um, when we finally did the real groundbreaking for the GLX project after three or four faux groundbreakings, um, Mayor Curta Tony said this project was one of the most important environmental justice projects in a very long time. And I would agree with him on that one. And the work that people did to value engineer that project and get it back on the federal government's radar and to get the billion dollars that was available through the work that was done by Congressman Capuano to get it released was a ton of work and a lot of effort on the part of a lot of people. And that one in particular, I think, has tremendous potential to deliver on a promise and a commitment that was made a really long time ago around environmental justice. The two others I would mention, one is um, the program we put together around parks and trees. Um, we've planted about 17,000 trees in gateway cities with many of our colleagues in the um, local communities and in the nonprofit world. And in addition to that, um, 17 of the 20 park projects we've done 
over the course of the past four years, which add up to sort of roughly 45 million or 55 million worth of spending, have been on parks in communities um, that would be described as neighborhoods that would benefit the most from this and for which an environmental justice tag would be appropriate. We also have the interagency group in place. Um, the council is identified and the job, a full-time position associated with this is currently posted. And we're anxious to pursue additional work in this. And one of the areas I'm really interested in is trying to figure out a way to do a lot more around access to some of the efficiency and green energy technologies uh, that are available, frankly, more often than not to people who have resources. And some of the stuff we've done with heat pumps and some of the stuff we've done with solar uh, hot water heaters and some of the stuff we've done with solar panels generally in public housing projects and low-income neighborhoods, um, I would like to do a lot more of that. And I think we, I think we can. Okay. Um, next question on water to the, from the Charles River Watershed Association. Hi, my name is Emily Norton with CRWA. Um, Governor, failing water infrastructure threatens public safety, public health, and the environment, especially in terms of our water resources. Massachusetts faces an estimated $21.4 billion funding gap over the next 20 years for water infrastructure. Assistance to communities has been intermittent with small-scale small grants and limited loan opportunities. As governor, would you support additional taxes or fees to cover this gap? And if not, what is your solution? Thank you. Well, one of the ones that um, I hope we managed to figure out a way to get the yes with the legislature on is the proposal that was in the Airbnb legislation for the Cape. Um, I was very supportive of that initiative uh, for a lot of reasons, not the least of which was it was one that was developed locally and everybody on the Cape bought in on it and it was designed to serve a very particular purpose associated with the near shore issues that they're dealing with down on the Cape. Um, but I couldn't sign the bill because first of all, we would have defaulted on the Convention Center Authority bonds um, and some of the other elements of it didn't quite do what I think people in the legislature thought they were gonna do. My hope is that that will eventually get passed and we can do something with it. Um, that type of initiative uh, I'm interested in, we'd be happy to do more of them. I also think some of the stuff we've done with respect to uh, the Clean Water Trust, and there's currently a $30 million appropriation sitting in front of the legislature on that, as well as the money that's in the environmental bond bill, which many people here helped us develop and advocated for, creates real opportunity to do additional work around um, water infrastructure generally. I also think the um, there are some new technologies developing in this space, and I think it's really important that we not miss that opportunity to take advantage of those. And that's the sort of thing that um, is probably gonna require some interesting relationships, not just with folks like you, but also with some of the academic institutions around here as well. All right, next question on the climate from Mothers Out Front. My name is Debbie New. I'm a member of Mothers Out Front. And I'm asking this question on behalf of my daughters, Sarah and Ellie, and all children. Attorney General Maura Healy issued a study that found that new gas pipelines are not needed for reliability purposes. At the same time, our legal requirements under the Global Warming Solutions Act and our commitments to the Paris Agreement both require us to more or less be off of fossil fuels by 2050. Given that we have to steadily reduce our consumption of fossil fuels over the next 30 years, do you agree that it does not make sense to expand our use of natural gas? And what will you do to ensure we do not waste billions of dollars on new gas pipelines or other major fossil fuel infrastructure projects? Thank you. Well, let me start by just saying that um, we wouldn't have worked so hard to pursue the legislation we got enacted in 2016 if we weren't interested in moving us as quickly as we could away from fossil fuels. And, um, and what's been particularly interesting to me about this, uh, on both the hydro project, but especially on the deep water wind project, is the impact that that project's had on the conversation associated with deep water wind generally all the way down the coast. Um, I don't think anybody thought you could get the kind of price point that we got out of that bid. Um, that came in at a level that was deemed as 
very affordable. And all of a sudden, um, a tremendous amount of activity uh, all the way down the eastern seaboard started to develop in a big hurry. And I actually think that one of the best, I happen to think that project's gonna be great for us, which is part of the reason why um, we agreed to, to chase the second tranche, for lack of a better way of putting it, uh, on a go-forward basis. But I also think that project and the work that was done, the procurement that was issued, and the results that came in were so surprising to so many people that we now have states all the way up and down the coast who are suddenly interested in getting into the deep water wind business. And I think one of the biggest problems we've had with alternative energy sources generally is we haven't been able to make the case that they're gonna come in at a price point um, that's consistent with what people are already paying. And that, that we are now over that hump to some extent on onshore wind, on deep water wind, and on uh, hydro. And I think those are really good things with respect to our ability to continue to grow that. The other thing I would say is we're the first administration to put serious money into storage. Um, over time, to really get the biggest bang we possibly can out of both wind and solar, we have got to come up with better answers and more answers and sturdier answers when it comes to storage. And that either needs to be distributed storage solutions or, um, or community-based storage solutions, but one way or another, uh, storage needs to be a big part of this if we're ultimately gonna be successful in dealing with your question. Uh, and then the third thing I would say about it is um, we advocated for the Clean Peak Standard in the legislation that just got passed. And the reason for that is most of the worst environmental and frankly economic energy that we buy, we typically buy during polar vortexes and other periods of really high peak demand over a long period of time, and they usually relate to thermal. And it is my hope that um, we can use a combination of storage and some of these other source uh, energy sources that we've developed to create big opportunities to save during low demand periods and use this to supplement our existing energy draw during periods of high demand. Um, I think in the short term and probably even the medium term, most of the work we're gonna need to do with respect to pipelines generally is gonna be around um, modernization, safety, and um, what I would describe as sort of investment in the existing system that we have. It represents about 50% of all of our electricity, it represents about 50% of all of our heat, um, and the incidents that took place in Lawrence North Andover and Andover were a big signal to us to do a very big independent analysis of the physical infrastructure associated with pipelines in Massachusetts generally, and a big review of the policies, procedures, and practices that are involved in um, upgrading, maintaining, and making that stuff safe. And I really do think that's going to be our focus for the immediate, for the immediate future. Just to uh, follow up, does that mean you do not support any new pipeline coming into the region? I really think the focus for the next few years needs to be on the existing infrastructure and ensuring that it's safe. That's going to be our focus. And not new pipeline. That's going to be our focus. <laughs> okay, uh, the next question is on climate resiliency from the Audubon Society. Pardon me, there are no questions. In 82 days, Governor Baker, uh, you ignore these on the way to that. I'm sorry, there's, there's no questions from the audience. Thank you. Am I right? Excuse me. Good afternoon, Governor. I'm Jack Clark, Mass Audubon. Are we not going to hear a response from the woman who sat outside your office for 82 days asking about the wind at the pressure station? We did exactly what she asked us to do, which was we engaged the public, created a very aggressive set of clean air measurement standards that were consistent with our role in that particular uh, incident, and it was deemed uh, by the mayor and by others in those that community is exactly what they were looking for from us. So is that project not going forward? We're doing the study that we said we were gonna do. And that study um, will be completed, I think, sometime after the first of the year. But that project and that study are interrelated. In the end, we don't make the call with respect to the project. We're making the call to provide the data and the information and the decision making at the state level that's associated with our role in that effort. Mr. Clark.
Clark, why don't you ask your question? Good afternoon, Governor. Um, Jack Clark, Mass Audubon. As you know, Massachusetts has made significant progress on climate resiliency this year, but there are still no standards that require or enforce consideration of future climate conditions for new construction. What will your administration do to move the needle on this issue? So, um, first of all, um, I wanna thank you for your leadership on the Municipal Vulnerability Program. Um, sometimes the way you get to the big bite is you take a whole bunch of small ones. And uh, for us, the opportunity through the executive order and now through the legislation that was passed uh, earlier this year to require everybody to put together a Municipal Vulnerability Plan and to then attach to it a hazard mitigation project is a gigantic opportunity, not just to learn, but also convert. And part of this is about, and I'll give you a perfect example of what I mean by that. We had this voluntary program in place, we had money associated with it to pay for it, and we were very aggressive about promoting it after we issued the executive order, and a lot of folks in this room helped us promote it as well. And we managed to get sort of 40 or 50 communities to come step up to the plate and participate in the program. And then we had four nor'easters in a row. And all of a sudden, and, that, and we basically said, we now have a two for one sale. Everybody that comes in um, after we had the nor'easters will be interested in um, making sure that we get the work done between now and the end of the fiscal year with you. And we had 70 communities suddenly show up. We're now up to about 160 all in that have participated. But part of the reason they came in was we had been pushing them to play and pushing them to play, and they eventually decided to jump um, once they had a really good reason, which was called the impact of those storms. And I think from our point of view, um, those initiatives are gonna give us the ability to do three things. Number one, figure out the best way regionally and by community to deploy a lot of the resources and the assets associated with the environmental bond bill to deal with the issues around adaptation and resiliency. The second is to give us the ability um, to think a little differently about how we deal with Chapter 91 issues and how we deal with uh, coastal zone management issues generally. And then number three is to come up with some guidelines associated with new construction. And I would expect and anticipate that that would probably happen sometime in sort of early to mid 2019. But the best part about that program and the best part about that initiative is it put it on the radar for a lot of folks in local government who hadn't been spending much time thinking about it. And by getting them into the conversation and into the dialogue, we now have a whole bunch of people who might have been inclined initially to resist some of the issues associated with this, a heck of a lot more interested in determining what happens next and how they get to participate and play. It's a big winner. Next question is on the environmental budget from the Appalachian Mountain Club. All right, I'm Heather Klisch with the Appalachian Mountain Club, and Governor, the question is this. Under both the Patrick and Baker administrations, environmental agencies have been chronically underfunded. Both administrations have failed to make meaningful progress toward the Green Budget Coalition's goal of 1% for the environment. What specific environmental line item or items would you increase in the upcoming budget? Um, I think, first of all, um, I apologize for not delivering on my promise. Um, the only caveat I could offer on the, well, I'm not even going to go there. I apologize for not delivering on my commitment. Um, I don't like not delivering on commitments that I make. With respect to this one, I think what I would say to you is to be very particular and very specific, which is, um, I'm mostly interested at this point uh, in personnel, and that personnel would be a DEP and DCR. Those two agencies um, have a lot to do. They're going to have a lot more to do on a go-forward basis if you think about all the stuff we've been talking about with respect to resiliency, adaptation, and many of these other issues. And uh, they did well in the fiscal 19 budget. Um, but those are two places where we absolutely need to increase our headcount with the right kinds of people into the right types of positions in a pretty serious way. The other thing I would say is when the results come in of the, um, the statewide review of the 
pipeline infrastructure, uh, I would anticipate um, that we'll probably want to make some investments in um, the field staff and the investigation and inspection staff at DPU as well. So um, the one percent, I've heard this mentioned a lot that you made a commitment to that. Uh, can you explain why you couldn't couldn't meet that commitment? Well. When I said it at the time, I, the one caveat, which I didn't mention here, because caveats are just caveats, um, was I didn't know what the budget was gonna look like or what we were gonna inherit. Um, it was a bad budget. Um, Taxpayers Foundation and most other people said that um, if you put the two years together, fiscal 15 and 16, which would've been the second half of the fiscal year we walked into and the first budget we actually prepared, the total problem we faced was probably about a billion dollars. Um, and we worked our way through it, um, through a whole series of initiatives of one type or another. And um, and we solved that problem, and we did a bunch of other things that were important to me um, and important to our administration, um, but we didn't get this one done. Just didn't. Um, next question on solid waste from the Conservation Law Foundation. Good afternoon. Thanks for being here, Governor. Alyssa Raymond Reed, Conservation Law Foundation. Recently, the your administration allowed Willebrader's online ash landfill in Saugus to expand capacity and continue accepting solid waste incinerator ash for up to 10 years. It is located in Rumney Marsh, an area of critical environmental concern. This waste incinerator is the oldest in the country. Its emissions adding health burdens to three densely populated designated environmental justice communities. According to Willow Raiders data, about 80% of what they burn to create the ash is compostable or recyclable. In your opinion, why did this expansion get approved? How would you instead reduce waste and or divert waste from dangerous landfills and incinerators in Massachusetts? The, um, let me start by saying that um, we do need to do some homework on the 80% thing because nobody that I've talked to in my administration knows where that came from. So point number one is it would be good to have um, a conversation with you guys about where the 80% came from. Um, our people also believe that it's a four-year <laughs> permit, not a 10-year permit, and that it basically operates within the framework of the original design of the original landfill. The, the other issue, there were two other issues that were associated with this that were important. One was um, as mitigation for that four year extension of their existing permit, um, they made a two and a half million dollar contribution to mitigate uh, a nearby landfill that was actually potentially creating some real harm on another watershed that was in the same vicinity. And we felt it was important to solve that problem um, as well. And we used the mitigation associated with that arrangement to do that. Um, we're big believers in food waste bans and recycling. And as I think everybody knows, we've had a lot of success on the food waste piece, especially with the big institutional players. The recycling market is in a very odd spot at this point in time. And we need to work with our colleagues here in the Commonwealth and around the region to come up with solutions to deal with both the recycling issue um, and the landfill and trash disposal issue generally. Um, I think one of the concerns we also had with respect to this particular initiative was putting all of that not incinerating all that waste and just putting it in trucks and driving it to some other place in the country and putting it in a landfill somewhere else just didn't strike us as particularly positive environmental policy either. Um, and I think folks felt that in this particular case, this was the best of the options that was available to us, recognizing that we're probably gonna have to do a number of things to change the way we deal with recycling um, and waste generally on a go forward basis given the changing nature of the world market there. Uh, next question on utility incentives from the Acadia Center. Good afternoon, Governor. Deborah Donovan, Acadia Center. 
Many here tonight are working to achieve the dual goals of reducing carbon emissions as fast as possible and deploying advanced clean energy technology to bring greater value to the state's energy consumers. A leading example of getting it mostly right is our energy efficiency program. Massachusetts is ranked first in the nation in energy efficiency for eight years now, and the programs have created over $20 million in benefits for Massachusetts ratepayers and are on track to deliver over one third of the carbon reductions we need by 2020. Unfortunately, the current business model for electric and gas utilities gives their shareholders a higher return on investments that are in direct opposition to reaching our goals. If elected, what would you do to modernize the gas and electric utility business models to better align with customer needs and the state climate policy objectives? Um, well, certainly one of the things is to create a program that makes recoverable the costs associated with what I talked about previously with respect to charging stations, which has happened. Um, but I think the big challenge on this one is, um, is actually going to be kind of expensive. And people need to think about um, how to do this in a way that maximizes the, the return on, on the investment, not so much for the folks that are doing it, but for the people who are going to be using it. And I'm talking there about on-peak, off-peak pricing, uh, real-time data around usage generally, and the use of smart metering as a mechanism to encourage people to think really differently than they have historically about how they do this stuff. And, um, and I, think the, I think the path forward on that is gonna end up being um, built around targeted approaches to big movement um, would be a big benefit to them and a big benefit to the system overall. And I think the, the major challenge that we're gonna face on that one um, is simply coming up with the right collection of folks to chase first so that um, there's demonstrated success attached to it, which will then make it easier to make it more broadly available generally. But there's no doubt in my mind that um, if you really want people to get strategic about how they use energy, we have to come up with a set of tools for them um, that they can use and understand and appreciate the benefit associated with, uh, with doing it. And in addition to that, um, figure out a way to factor that into um, the way we pay for it uh, overall. Because this is, not, this is not a small initiative. If you really chase the smart metering strategy all the way down, um, it's probably a billion dollars over time. But the benefit associated with that, um, if people really understand it, take advantage of it, and use it in conjunction with um, a pricing model that's on peak and off peak, uh, could be profound for both utilization, efficiency, and the system overall. Um, but that is really where I think the big opportunity there rests. And we're gonna push it pretty hard. So I had a question, a follow-up question about utilities. Yeah. Do you think they're in the middle of a lot of these debates, um, offshore wind, they were evaluating the bidders and they were also bidders as well, on, as well as hydro. Do you think their their role is, is too pronounced or do you think they're, it's about right the way it is now? Um, I think the, let's put it this way. The whole thing is set up around what I would describe as sort of a regional command and control system. I mean, if you go all the way to ISO, which basically manages almost all the issues associated with the rules of the game with respect to the New England region, um, they have, for all intents and purposes, sort of the primary role in ensuring that there are no brownouts, there are no blackouts, that there's enough power available to service the region and the, um, and the residents and the, and the businesses in it. And we are the largest user, but there are five other states that play in that same space. You go from there to the utilities who have the fundamental responsibility for sourcing energy and ensuring that it gets to wherever it is it's supposed to go. On the, on the transmission and distribution side of things. And it's not a model 
And so it's a model that starts with a very sort of top-down command control. This is the way it's organized. This is the way it works, right? And when you start talk talking about giving people price, people at the retail level, uh, opportunities to think differently about how they access energy, how they, what they pay for it, and how they could strategically make decisions about that. Um, almost by definition, you're gonna end up in kind of a complicated and difficult space for some period of time. And I think we're probably heading into a pretty complicated and difficult space with regard to that. Because you still gotta figure out how to keep the infrastructure you need to keep in place to serve the people who aren't going to be the sophisticated and strategic purchasers who have the ability to actually do a lot of the things that are associated with smart metering or storage or some of these other things um, as you go through the process of trying to create a more distributed and what I would describe as sort of market driven approach to this stuff. And and I think the big question is how fast can you get there? And I think some of that becomes a question of how good a job we do figuring out which players are most likely to move most quickly, how big a play do they represent in terms of the market overall, and then how fast can that be translated into people, um, businesses, residents, and others who may not bring quite the same level of um, sort of capacity generally to take advantage of those opportunities. And I think that's a big challenge, but that's the challenge I think for um, for whoever sits in, in the seat that I'm in and the folks on the team and everybody else for the next four to eight to 10 years. Two minutes to have your closing statement. Um, well, first of all, again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and I very much appreciate uh, the chance to engage in the in the debate and discussion. I think. I think what I would say to close is that um, these issues are incredibly important. They touch everybody one way or another. They have a sense of urgency about them that if anybody doubted that we needed to be thinking differently about this stuff, the last 12 to 18 months, 24 months, should convince them otherwise. Um, we had 111 inches of snow in 25 days, 20 days after I took office. Um, the polar vortex is gonna show up at least every other year, maybe every year, as far into the future as you can get. You can just watch the heat map of the top of the world just push it right off of, um, right off of the polar ice cap and right down into North America on top of us. Um, and we had five big storms, really big storms, here over the course of the last 18 months, um, not to mention the storms that have affected um, so many other parts of uh, this country and the world. And, um, and I think the biggest challenge that we face and the way I think about this is um, you have to build coalitions, you have to create opportunities for people to appreciate the benefits both environmentally and economically that are associated with some of the choices and the options that are in front of them. And, um, and you have to be what I would describe as relentlessly aggressive about it. And I'll come back to the, to the MBTA um, as my closing analogy. Um, just giving the MBTA more money without figuring out how to make it a lot smarter about how it does what it does and spends what it gets, honest to God, would not have accomplished much. The biggest thing we needed to do with respect to the T was get it to the point where it could actually intelligently spend the resources that we made available to it, follow through on it, and execute on a game plan. And it is finally getting to the point where it can do that. And I sort of feel the same way when I talk about some of these other issues that I feel about the T, which is you can't, you can't wave a wand and get everybody where you want them to be on this. You have to figure out a way to get the people who are most likely to chase it hardest, first, involved, and then prove to people 
that there's a big opportunity here and others will follow. And I think the fact that so many people have suddenly discovered deep water wind as a result of that procurement we did is a big statement about what happens if you actually prove to people that there's not just an environmental benefit here, but an economic one as well. And if we pick the right players and we take the right path on some of these issues associated with distributing some of the decision making around the grid, the more people we get involved in that and the more organizations we get involved in that who find a benefit and can prove that it works, the ball starts to roll. And that's how you get a lot of these other folks into the game. And um, I think there's tremendous opportunity there. And um, I may have sort of an odd way of thinking about it compared to the way a lot of other people do. But, um, but I can tell you this, if we're fortunate enough to have another four years, you will have a much better MBTA. You will have a far more strategic approach to the way we engage people around opportunities to get really aggressive about modernizing the grid and investing in new technologies like storage and creating opportunities to <coughs> truly play at the retail level in a way people have never been able to play. And, uh, and we will create a coalition of local communities, local communities. They're gonna be wildly interested in adaptation and resiliency and are gonna help us come up with the strategies and the funding and the mechanisms to actually pull that stuff off. Thank you. On behalf of all the sponsoring organizations, thanks very much for coming here today. Appreciate it.